Want to join me? <laughs> Want to join me? <laughs> All right. What the heck? <laughs> Jesus, my passion in life is to know you. May all of the goals both bow down to this journey of love in you more. Jesus, you showered your goodness on me. Given your gifts so freely, but there's one thing I'm longing for. Hear my heart's cry and my prayer for this life. Give me yourself Savior The more that I see your beauty The more that I glimpse your glory My heart is captured by you You are my greatest treasure Nothing this world can offer Could ever compare to you So hear my heart's cry And my prayer Give me yourself above all else, above all else, above all else. Give me yourself here. My heart's cry and my prayer for this life above all else, above all else, above all else. Give me. The Lord be with you. Welcome to our, the worship service here at Faith in Pleasant Hill. At least I think that's where I'm at. That's where I aimed the car this morning. You know, when I was a small child, I had a favorite toy. It was called a jack-in-the-box. You know, you'd turn the crank, and then all of a sudden, yeah, some clown stood up and 
I would laugh and laugh and laugh. It must have been a pleasant surprise, I suppose. Well, every once in a while you get a surprise. Some pastor standing up here that uh, you haven't seen in a while. Fortunately, you've seen me before. <laughs> That's why some of you brought your seat cushions, because you know I preach long. <laughs> well, you get what you get. <laughs> But uh, I'm happy to be here. Now, uh, your Pastor Dave is working this morning. Not here, though. He's up in Reading. Uh, he's a ladies' man today. He's with the LWML, Lutheran Women's Missionary League, a whole convention of them, including my wife is up there. Says, but I'm here. <laughs> so he can be there. And that's one of the neat things in having a few retired pastors around because uh, every once in a while there's some holes to fill. So it's my pleasure to be here with you today, and I hope it's your pleasure joining me for worship. Okay, and I understand that we have an announcement this morning, and it's one that you don't want to miss, Okay. Mary uh, Wolkenauer asked me to mention that she needs volunteers, and we're looking ahead to May 1819 booth at Pleasant Hill Art and Wine Festival, so we need volunteers for that, as well as the July 4th parade in Pleasant Hill, and July 8th through 9, VBS, which is a big one, and uh, we need lots of help for that. And so she has sign-ups in the Narthex, and so uh, please be generous with your time for those things. And I guess I would just also mention that the Women of Faith brunch this coming up uh, May 4th. Is it my house? <laughs> so come, please. In, in Venetia, I know it's a crisis to have to drive over the bridge, but anyway, I would love to have you come. And Tim and I have a, a little announcement about ourselves here. <laughs> well, the party's at my house, too. <laughs> Morning, everybody. Uh, today's a very special day for Oral and I. If 50 years ago today, we joined faith to the day. So. <laughs> So we would like to invite you for coffee and cake uh, after the service. And then Laurel has a little bit more here. I just want to call your attention to the banners. Those are new, and Tim and I are donating those to Faith uh, in, uh, to mark this occasion, I guess you would say. So. All right. Any other announcement? Okay. Must be Boy Scout Sunday today. Eagle project has two parts. Um, we're building two, we built two benches for the preschool. They go in the hallway outside the bathroom so the kids have somewhere to sit before they go to the bathroom. Uh, that we completed last weekend. Um, and upcoming on May 4th, we have the garden restoration. So we're going to be restoring the two garden beds in front of the church, the one underneath the sign and the one in front of the fence that borders the preschool playground. So a big part of my Eagle project is to create a proposal and present it for approval, which I did. And the church leadership group and Pastor Dave approved it, so thank you. Um, and to help with the cost of the materials for this project, I'd like to ask for your help. 
My budget for the project is between two and three thousand dollars, so it's pretty good considering it's an Eagle project. Um, and there are two ways that you can help out. So one is, of course, monetary donation. Uh, you can make a check out to the church and put it in an envelope labeled um, Eagle Project, and you can do that during the offering. Um, you can also do cash and put that in an envelope labeled um, Eagle Project and donate that during the offering. And then there's another way. Uh, you can also donate succulents um, because we're going to be planting succulents in the gardens out there because they're drought tolerant. Um, you can do that by taking any succulents you have that you don't need, um, anything that you feel like you want to give, uh, give away, you can do that. Um, so yeah, uh, if you have any questions, um, let me know. Thank you. Okay, I don't know whether or not he's already uh, uh, won one of those uh, mayor badges for bravery, but we can certainly sign him up for one today because he's done a good job. <laughs> okay, let's rise for the invocation and then we'll continue right on through the opening song. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Huh? Are we ready for the music? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're going to sing the song of silence, or what is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much you mean to me now that you have saved me, Lord. I, I give you all that I am, that every day I can be the light that shines your name. Every day, Lord, I'll learn to stand upon your word and I pray that I. I may come to know you more that you will give me the in every single step I take that every day I can be the light unto your world every day it's you I live for every day I'll follow after you every day I'll walk with you my say, Lord, it's you who gave me life, and I can't explain just how much you mean to me now that you have saved me, Lord. I'll give all that I am to you, that every day I can be the light that shines your name every day. It's you I live for every day. I'll follow after you every day. I'll walk with you, my Lord. Every day, it's you I live for. Every day, I'll follow after you. Every day, I'll walk with you, my Lord. It's you I live for. Every day, it's you I live for. 
for every day. It's you I live for every day. Every day, it's you I live for every day. I'll follow after you every day. I'll walk with you, my Lord. Every day, it's you that I live for, most of the time. Sometimes. Sometimes we don't. In a moment of honesty, we come before our Father and say, I haven't been what you would like me to be. I tried, but I failed. We might expect God to be very upset with us. But he has far more patience than what I ever had as a parent with my own children, even though I loved them. And he loves us too. So we come to face him, acknowledging our shortcomings, but also confident in his care for us. By faith we walk in the promises of God, that through faith in Jesus we receive pardon and peace. So let us cast aside everything that hinders our walk of faith and look to God to restore and empower us through his grace and mercy. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that by faith our future is secure in you, and by faith we can show the world you love. The grace of God is upon you, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I announce to you the grace of God. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue with our song of praise. <clears throat>
my one request for my only aim is that you reign in me again lord reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour The first lesson is found in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is from 1 John chapter 3, 16 to 24. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit whom he has given us. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to read the gospel today, standing next to the Christ candle. Please rise in honor of the risen Lord. The gospel is recorded in John chapter 10. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. 
and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. And so there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join in confessing the Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and uh, now it's time for children's chat. Good morning, ladies. How are we today? Looking pretty cool already for summer. So I have a question. What's, what is this person? He's a shepherd. That's right. What does a shepherd do? What does a shepherd do, Mia? Um, he, like, he has um, a bunch of sheep and he wants to protect them. That's right. He has a bunch of sheep and he wants to protect them. So if I was going to interview someone for a shepherd position, what kind of skills would I be looking for on a resume? Yes, Mia. That's a good thing, yeah. As she said, if, if I asked this person if he liked to kill sheep and this person said, no, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, so, other, any other ideas of what kind of skills this person might have? Maybe he knows a lot about sheep. And he knows where to find food and water for the sheep to eat and drink. And he's got to be brave because he's got to protect the sheep from scary things like lions and bears. And he has to watch over them to keep them from getting lost because sheep aren't the smartest of creatures. So these are some really good skills to be a good shepherd. And I don't know if you guys were listening in today's gospel lesson. You were. So you, you can see we're going to talk about shepherds today. In uh, John chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus says, he is the good shepherd. And that makes sense. Jesus has a lot of good shepherd skills. You know, like, first of all, he knows a lot about us, doesn't he? And he provides for our daily needs. And he's very brave to have conquered the devil, our enemy. And he keeps an eye on us because he knows that sometimes we're not very bright. <laughs> but in that same verse, he also says that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now, do you think that that person who submitted the resume is willing to die for my sheep? Can you even imagine a job description that states the applicant must be willing to die for uh, defending a flock? I don't think anyone would take that job with that being a condition of employment. Nobody wants to die for sheep that aren't even his own. There are levels to commitment, after all. 
But when Jesus says that he is the good shepherd, he also says that he is willing to lay down his life for his sheep. And he meant it through and through. He looks at us and he says, you are my sheep, you belong to me, and I will lay down my life for you. As undeserving as we are, we are in fact the apple of his eye, and he loves us so very much. That's what that cross is about. Our good shepherd, Jesus, gave everything he had so that we would survive and we would live and we would be forgiven and set free and blessed forever. He paid the price for our sins in full when he died on that cross. And the best news is, though, he didn't stay dead, did he? What happened on that Easter morning? Yeah? Well, he rose from the dead, didn't he? And it is for that reason that we can joyfully say, he is risen. Risen indeed. Alleluia. Okay, let's uh, end in a prayer. This time you guys get to help out. Dear Jesus, thank you for being the good shepherd. Thank you for laying down your life for mine. And thank you for loving us that much. Amen. Okay, guys, I think Miss Chris is ready for you guys for Kids Connection. Shepherd of my soul
follow Oh, lead me by the hand As I travel through this barren land I will fix my eyes on you And you alone Shepherd of my soul Shepherd of my soul Maker of my heart Keeper of my life I will follow Oh, lead me by the hand As I travel through this barren land I will fix my eyes on you I will fix my eyes on you, oh shepherd of my soul, baker of my heart, keeper of my life, I will follow, oh lead me by the hand, as I travel through this barren land, I will be Shepherd of my Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now this is, uh, my dear friends, this is a wind machine that operates on water. And from time to time I will need to take a sip. If I get too dry, raise your hand and I'll share it with you. <laughs> the Good Shepherd, one of my favorite Sundays. Always the fourth Sunday of Easter. In fact, all the Sundays in the Easter season are identified that way. A Sunday that, I mean, Easter isn't just one Sunday that we put away then. We celebrated for six to seven weeks. It's a beautiful time. My text is, of course, the gospel lesson for today. And um, John chapter 10, you, we just read one short section of it. But we'll take the entire chapter because it has a unity and it all ties together to give us a complete picture of why we call him a good shepherd and why that shepherd is so good for us. That chapter is filled with shepherding imagery and what they do to care for their sheep. And the people of Israel were very familiar with that. Even today, if you were to visit the Holy Land, wherever you would travel, you would frequently see sheep being in the pastures and a shepherd tending them. It was uh, about 20 years ago. That was my third trip over. And I had gotten up very early in the morning, my wife and I, to go over to the Mount of Olives and to stand there overlooking the city. But early in the morning, just as the sun is coming up and watching the color change as it's reflected upon the limestone walls, 
beautiful, 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 and very peaceful. Jerusalem is noise, a city of peace, but that morning it was. Well, almost. Because in the distance we could hear, and then we could see. Bah, bah, bah. There was a, a pen open, no roof on it, just a walled pen, and then a certain gate there. And as we watched, a man approached the gate. And standing there at the gate, it was open, and he began to call the sheep. And a number of them responded and came to where he was and followed him out. And he would lead them to the pasture where they would graze that day. But not all the sheep went. And then it dawned on me. Not all the sheep in that fold belong to that shepherd. The sheep will not follow a stranger, but they recognize their shepherd, and they hear his voice, and that voice is full of promise of good grazing, safe water, and protection, and they trustingly follow. The rest stay put. Hopefully, later that day, their shepherd will come, and he'll do the same thing. He'll call them out, and they will follow. But it was a powerful image. And Jesus is making reference to that today. The more that you understand what shepherding is like and what it takes, and I think most of us have a fairly good idea. If not, we've heard enough sermons about it that we should begin to. But the more that we understand that, the better we understand the relationship and God's care for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. But it's also helpful if we understand that this chapter needs to be seen in the light of the Old Testament emphasis of a concept of a shepherd symbolizing a royal protector of God's people. Usually a king, but it could also apply to priests and other leaders too. God himself was called a shepherd. Psalm 23 quickly comes to mind, but there are others. Psalm 80, Isaiah 40, Ezekiel 34. God not only was the shepherd, but he needed uh, some human helpers working under him to guide and protect his people, the priests, the kings, the prophets, and the elders of the people. Some of them, however, did not take their task very seriously. They weren't good shepherds. Finally, God promised that he himself would come and through a king that he would raise up would himself shepherd his people. He was referring to the sending of the Messiah. And so when Jesus speaks in chapter 10, being a shepherd, a good shepherd, he's very explicit calling himself God's Messiah, the faithful, good shepherd. So what makes Jesus so good? That's what chapter 10 is about. And four points today. First of all is his integrity of person and his message and his mission. 
Second, it is his proven love and compassion for his people, best exemplified by him laying down his life on the cross. Third is his Easter victory, his power over death. The story didn't end with his crucifixion. That's only the beginning of the story of a whole new book, a whole new chapter. And finally, it is his ongoing, continuing care for his sheep, providing for them under shepherds so that they might continue to gather and add to the number of flock that hear his voice and follow him and find life, abundant life, eternal life. So first of all, the good shepherd's integrity, his integrity of his person, his integrity of his message, and the integrity of his mission. Jesus begins with these words, the man who enters the sheep pen by the gate, he is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him. And the sheep listen to his voice. He calls the sheep by name, and he leads them out. But not all men approach the sheep by the gate. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but he climbs in by some other way, he is a thief and a robber. A thief and not a robber. He doesn't come in by the approved way. He uses the, under, uh, the covering of darkness to sneak in, climbing over the wall, What's his object? Snatch and run with the sheep. He doesn't care about the sheep. He doesn't care about nurturing sheep and giving them life. He only cares for lamb chops. The sheep will perish. Well, Jesus, though, comes and he approaches by the gate. He doesn't use subterfuge. He doesn't come in some other way that's unexpected. He approaches fully credentialed. Fully credentialed. He only preaches the words which God has given him, the message he's been given to deliver, calling people to repentance and giving them good news about what we heard this morning. It is the plan of God, the will of God, to give his sheep eternal life. So he comes with credibility of message. And all of his life, was an exhibit of his compassion for people. Matthew 12 tells us that he saw the people and he had great compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so what did he do? He spent hours, day after day, reaching out to hurting people, broken people, confused people, lost people, dying people, healing them comforting them, forgiving them. He had great compassion for people. And in healing, he was doing mighty works. Mighty works that should have been his credentials wherever he went. And in fact, they were. It had opened many doors for ministry to him. What was it Nicodemus said when he 
in chapter 3, came to Jesus at night. Maybe he was a busy man. The only time he could get to Jesus was when everyone else was asleep. Or maybe he needed to come in under the cover of darkness because the rest of the people might think strange of him that he's going after this new rabbi that some people were raising some questions about. But he came. And what did he say? Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher sent by God because no one could do the things you do unless God was with him. Chapter 9, right before chapter 10, is the story of Jesus healing a man who had been blind all of his life, never had seen, not even the first day. He was born blind. But he healed him. Well, that caused quite a stir. The people who knew him in the synagogue where he went to church, well, they knew something dramatic had happened or what. And so he told them that, that Jesus had healed him. Well, the church leaders, those self-appointed shepherds of the synagogue, they raised all sorts of questions. Who do you say this man is? We know who he is. He's just a sinner. And he's teaching people to do bad things. Bad because it had a new sound to it and a new emphasis to it. And you know, they, they condemned anything that sounded new. Actually, what they were, they were very jealous about it, his popularity. And they were out to get him. But they interviewed this man who Jesus had helped. His mighty work that he had done. And rather than being amazed at it, you know, they were casting all sorts of aspersions. But what do you think, they asked the man. He said, he must be a man of God. Oh, no, he's not a man of God, he's a sinner. Well, the man replied, no one has ever heard of a man opening the eyes of one born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't do anything. Jesus' credentials, his mighty works, and the evidence of his great compassion for people and to make a difference in their life. That's what opens the door. That's why he boldly go to the door. He doesn't have to climb over the back wall or in the cover of the night. He doesn't have to use some gimmicks. He let his works do the talking. There he stands before the gate. The watchman for the night recognizes the shepherd and opens the gate. And then he stands there and he calls the sheep and they recognize his voice. Day after day, he's led them out to pasture and safe waters. Day after day, he's protected them out there in the wilds. They knew he was a good shepherd. His credentials were well known by them from personal experience. Can't we testify how our relationship with Jesus has blessed us day in and day out? Sometimes when we had to walk through a dark shadow, the valley of the dark shadow, or sometimes when we were scared for our safety, but again and again, or times when we were sick, and he rose us to health again. His credentials, they are impeccable. We talked about his love and his compassion. Well, let me go one step further. He not only comes by the gate, but listen very carefully what he says then. 
I'll tell you the truth. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. This is tantamount to another statement he'll make three chapters later, John chapter 14. Four, excuse me, my math is bad. Four chapters later. John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. No one can approach the real source of our life, abundant life and eternal life, except through me. He not only stands at the gate and his works and his credentials open doors for ministry, he is the gate because what he now does for us is absolutely essential. And the great proof of his love for his sheep. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, he's not a shepherd. He doesn't own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Picture Jesus in Gethsemane. The soldiers come to arrest him. He knows what's going to happen, but he doesn't run away. Unfortunately, all of his disciples did, but he did not run. No hireling leaving his sheep, even though his sheep leave him. But he takes his stand for the sake of those very sheep and will gather them again and restore them and send them forth to preach good news of the gospel of forgiveness. He lays down his life for the sheep. That's the primary proof of his care for his sheep, that he is a true and a faithful shepherd and will never leave us in the lurch. And Jesus' death was no unfortunate accident when the appointed and self-appointed shepherds of Israel who were such a disappointment to God because they didn't fulfill their duties for his people. When they jealously turned on the one he sent then to be the faithful guardian and shepherd of his sheep, They turned on him and they killed him. That was no accident. It was something in God's plan that went wrong. There was a glitch someplace. No, no glitch. And when you read carefully chapter 10, you'll see that undergirding it is a sense of this huge plan hatched in heaven itself and from eternity between the Father and the Son. And Jesus will talk about, I have authority to lay my life down. No one takes it from me. I laid it down for them. And I have the Father's approval, permission. I operated with full authority to lay my life down. 
that was the plan, and he was faithful to it for our sake. No matter what it cost him, he did it willingly for you and for me and for many. Think of it. Ah. And because of that, the shepherd becomes a sheep. His cousin John the Baptist pointed it out very early in his ministry. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I don't know if he had the Passover lamb in mind or whether or not he had the many sheep that were sin offerings. But and maybe the great sheep of the Day of Atonement when the sins of all of Israel were atoned for by the death of that sheep and the sprinkling of his blood upon the altar in the Holy of Holies on the mercy seat. It doesn't matter which lamb he had in mind. This is the lamb of atonement. And John himself, in his first epistle, will give us the picture and what that sacrifice accomplished. My dear children, I write this so that you do will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our behalf, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. And not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Nothing short of the Son of God himself becoming the Lamb of God could atone for all those sins. The sins of the whole world. But now for the rest of the story. Jesus says, I also have the authority to lay my life down and the authority to take it up again. We just celebrated that, didn't we? At Easter. He takes up his life again. I know sometimes Scripture talks about God raising him from the dead. And he did. It was part of his plan that it should be so. And the resurrection of Jesus becomes the Father's approval of everything that he said, everything that he did, and above all, the acceptance of that sacrifice for the sins of the world. I approved. It is accomplished. It is finished. Paid in full. Sometimes it talks about Jesus taking up his life again. Well, that was the plan. Does it make any difference? He's raised from the dead. And what that says to us, hey, this shepherd that goes out and he walks us through the valley of the dark shadow of death, guess what? He's bigger than death. Death could not hold him. The grave could not hold him. He's bigger than that. He's big enough and strong enough and powerful enough and mighty enough and has all that authority, not only to take up his own life, but to give us life too. That's what makes Jesus so great. His integrity of life, his message, his mission, the depth of his love, laying his life on the cross, but the power and strength that he commands as one who has conquered our worst enemy, our final enemy, death itself. One more. He's not finished. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. And they too will listen to my voice. 
and there will be one flock and one shepherd. As he was approaching his passion, it, estimates are that maybe he had gathered 120 people. That's about what it was at the time of the Pentecost. At the end of Pentecost, the number swelled to 3,000. A few weeks later, it had swollen already to 5,000. And the estimates is that at the end of the book of Acts, the church may have numbered around 30 to 35,000. You want to guess what it measures today? Approximately 2.8 million. Billion. <laughs> Excuse me. There's 8 billion people in the world. And about a third of them are Christian. When Jesus says, I have other foals that are not of this one. And sheep that belong to them. He saw where this was going. And what it would take. That's why he trained these disciples. That's why he filled them with his Holy Spirit so they'd be bold and courageous as they went about continuing his work, bringing the gospel to people. And by the way, he's talking about you here. You're one of those folds, right? Maybe not a terribly big fold. I don't know what your numbers are. Well, yes, I do. I looked it up. It all depends on who's counting. Uh, pastors sometimes fib on their reports. But about 220 some. That's not big as far as congregations go, although the Missouri Senate has a lot of small congregations of this size. Then they all are important to Jesus, each and every one of them. He was talking about you and me, the gathering of sheep that don't know him yet, but they soon will. They will hear his voice and follow him, and he will give them life. That's what happens here. Every Sunday, you get to hear the shepherd's voice. Oh, yeah, I know you get to hear Pastor Dave. Uh, by the way, why do you call him pastor? Do you know what the word pastor means? From the Latin, it literally means a shepherd. So, when you hear Pastor David, and assuming he's done his homework, and studied the text well. You're hearing the voice of the Good Shepherd. Still speaking. Still inviting. Still gathering. His sheep. Come. Follow me. And I will lead you to life. Abundant life. Eternal life. You see, his goodness is still evident in the very fact that you're here and that you have a faithful shepherd that you can rightfully call pastor. He's not the chief pastor. That's Jesus and always will be. And it doesn't mean he's always perfect. There's no human that ever lived with the exception of Jesus as he took in human nature into his person as the second person of the Trinity. No one is, is perfect. But you're not shepherdless. I read recently that an airline pilot makes anywhere between 140000 and 500000 a year. It's 
It's a lot of money. It, it all depends on how much experience he has and how big the plane is that he's flying. But think of the weight of responsibility he has. He may take off and land three to four times in a day. Each time he can carry anywhere between 150 to 400 people. And you don't read about many accidents. Well, yeah, some parts fall off, but that's when your pilot really is worth his money. That when those things go wrong, he can still get that plane on the ground. It's a lot of money. Well, your pastor is a sky pilot. If you were from Boonville, they would call you a Skype. Abbreviation for sky pilot. I don't know if any pastor, at least in the Missouri Senate, that's making even 140,000, although I suspect there might be a few. I don't think there's any of them making 500,000. But again, consider the responsibility. I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing that you should dig a little deeper and pay them more. There's a lot of other ways to show him your love and respect than how much you pay him. But at the same time, do remember, as St. Paul says, the laborer is worthy is higher. Think about the responsibility and pray for that man. There has to be days when that's heavy trucking. Help him pay his bills. Help him take care of his family. Give him encouragement. Use your talents to undergird his ministry. Be careful with your gossip. Give him words of encouragement. There's lots of ways to show love for the one who is showing Jesus' love for you in spades. By the way, I haven't told him what I was going to talk about today other than the Good Shepherd. So if he hasn't approved this or even is aware that I put in a good word for him. But it comes from a pastor's heart with about 59 years of pastoral experience. So I think it fits. We got a good man. Take good care of him. He's a fair reflection of the good shepherd. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. We continue then with the offering. <clears throat>
You may remain seated for the prayers. Uh, one special petition has been requested that uh, we pray for a preschool family who is asking for prayers for a family issue that they're facing. And so we will include them, not by name, but uh, to the situation. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray for the church as it awaits the final advent of our Lord, that through it, that is through the church, the message of salvation may be proclaimed and the gifts of God may be shared. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those with special needs and concerns this day, and especially the hospitalized, the grieving, the unemployed, for all that's on our hearts at this time, and for that school family as they walk through a valley with the dark shadow cast over them. For all these, Lord, we pray that you would, by your presence, strengthen them, encourage them, give them hope in their moments of trial and darkness, and that they may faithfully follow, trusting that you will lead them to abundant life, that you haven't abandoned them, that your mercy and truth will follow them. Lord, in your mercy, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now let us rise as we enter and prepare for the Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. Blessed are you, almighty Lord, King of all creation. You have blessed our lives with your presence and your protection and with peace. Now, gathering at your table, may we be strengthened in faith toward you and in fervent love for one another as we await your final coming in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us to sanctify and renew us in body and soul for the sake of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we offer our thanksgiving. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this cup is the covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
may be seated. The King of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine. Child is 
tidy things up and when they were finished would be nice. But it would take a cloth bigger than you and I could handle. <laughs> Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, for you have refreshed us through the salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now receive the blessing of our Lord. No, that's, we've got a song first, don't we? Okay. <laughs> Like a shepherd, lead us, much we need your tender care. In your pleasant pastures, feed us, for our use your fold prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, you have bought us, we are yours. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, you have bought us, we are yours. We are yours in love, befriend us, be the guardian of our way. Keep your flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear us children when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear us children when we pray. You have promised to receive us, be the God you are pure be. You have mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to you. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to you. Early let us seek your favor, early let us do your will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with your love our spirits fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, you have loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, you have loved us, love us still. And now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Go in peace now. Serve the Lord. <laughs>